Hello and welcome to Thriving in Intersectionality, a podcast created to help you learn from professionals in the workplace who have multiple intersectional identities. From ethnic minorities, veterans transitioning into the workforce, individuals with disabilities, parents, and so many more. My name is Lola Adeyemo. I am the CEO of EQI Mindset and the founder of the nonprofit Immigrants Incorporate Inc. I work with organizations to build inclusive workplaces. This podcast was built to amplify the voices of leaders and immigrants in the corporate workplace and to give insights and guidance so people can move past their barriers and advance in their professional careers. Through interviews and solo episodes, I'm going to examine this global world of work. I know that you can learn a thing or two from my guests who have a range of experiences and stories to share. Join me as we meet new people who are successfully navigating the corporate space. Hello and welcome to the Thriving in Intersectionality podcast. In this episode, I have a power duo for you. Kicking off with Joyce Orishaba. She's a junior at Poway to Paloma Middle College High School in North San Diego. Joyce was one of 13 winners of the New York Times 100 Word Student Essay Competition out of more than 12,000 entries. She wrote a moving story about her earlier life in Uganda, which brought greater awareness to the plight of the indigenous Batua tribe. Joyce is a member of the National Honor Society, a Civics Unplugged Fellow 2022, and head of our school's music production club. She has interned for Redemption Song Foundation for several summers, a nonprofit founded by her adoptive mom to empower the Batua through livelihood projects, education, and community development. Joyce is working on developing Discover the Lost Tribe an ambassadorship program to connect American and Batwa team. She loves to sing, surf, and dance. And I'm going to add to write because her essay was very powerful. And she's going to be reading that for us here. But I'm also having a mom, Wendy Nicole, join us. Wendy founded Redemption Song Foundation in 2014, a nonprofit focused on providing education and community development support for the indigenous Batwa in Uganda. Wendy sees the work as not only an act of faith, but also social justice, since the tribe was possibly removed from their ancestral homeland in the 1990s and live in some of the world's worst conditions. Wendy writes about wildlife, health, and social justice from her home in San Diego and travels to Uganda as often as possible while raising her adopted daughter as a single mother. She loves nature, photography, movies, and Jesus. I know you're going to have a great time listening to these powerful women as they talk about the initiatives they are driving and the power of sharing your story. Enjoy. Are you a corporate professional who is an immigrant or a child of immigrant? Are you looking for a community of support to advance your corporate career? Immigrants in Corporate, IIC, is a nonprofit that is building a community for you. Come and join us on Facebook. The Facebook group is Immigrants in Corporate. Belong and thrive in the workplace. See you there. All right. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Joyce. Nice Hi. to have you here. Thank you for joining me. I am excited to dive right in. So, Joyce, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. Let's hear it. Can you read your essay for us? Yes. Um, I am six years old, sleeping with nothing but a banana leaf over my shoulders to keep me warm. Tears fall as I see the fear and uncertainty in my eyes and my aunt's eyes. She is 13, she is my mom now, and we are lost. The indigenous Batwa lost our home, the rainforest, to the mountain gorillas. 
We have forgotten why the gorillas are celebrated, lost to save the species. As the sun rises, the next day, I run to Monyaga River and watch it become stronger and stronger. I will be the river for my people. I am the future. So, Joyce, thank you for that. You won a New York Times essay competition, beating out thousands of other students. So, tell us how you felt and what this means for you as a young leader moving forward. Um, well, at first, I didn't really, like, think much of it. Like, I didn't think anybody was really going to, like, care about my story or even, like, listen about it. I was, like, inspired by my mom to, like, write it. And I was like, well, nobody's actually going to care, you know. But once it came out, I was like, okay, I won. Okay, I didn't really understand what that meant. I was like, okay, cool. I won out of 12,000 people. And then as I realized that there were more people, like, trying to, like, actually get interested in it and people actually reading it and people, the news wanted me in their, in their videos or whatever, I was like, oh, this is something. This is actually something that could help me raise awareness for my people I could really use this and actually start standing up like this is this is the beginning to actually start helping my people through this attention that I'm getting for winning this essay that I didn't realize I could win so thank you thank you for being bold enough to share it Um, a lot of movement starts with way more than that you shared your story you were vulnerable and that's all it takes um, Wendy, how are you feeling about this? I was so proud of her. I um, Just based on the story itself, I felt like she had a really strong potential to at least be a finalist, you know, to be because they had, I think, 100 finalists. And out of those, there were 13 winners. And when they told her she was a finalist, I was really excited. But then mm-hmm. when they said, you actually are one of the winners, I just... I was just really excited for her and very proud um, of her ability to share um, that vulnerable story and to use her personal story in a way to, you know, advocate for the Batwa tribe, the Batwa people, and um, to let the world know about what's going on over there halfway around the world. You know, like the essay says, everyone knows about mountain gorillas, but very few people understand that there was a whole indigenous tribe that was very much hurt to save we love the gorillas but uh, to save the species another um a group of people was harmed in the process so yeah um, yeah well the power of our stories when we share our stories we can do so much more so thank you joyce for sharing your story this beautiful essay and for those listening you would have the details the link to see uh the story about the competition that uh joyce won with sharing this story and and where to get more information. So let's flow to what next after that. So Joyce, you started a program, Discover the Lost Tribe. Tell us a little bit about that program and how you're going to use this program to help your people. Um, Well, uh, this program, I kind of had an idea about when I first, like a couple years after I got to America, I was like, what is something I could do to like bring my friends from Africa to come here with me so they can enjoy this experience with me. Oh, the other way around, bring America to them to begin with. So um, this year, I the reason why I came up with the word Discover the Lost Tribe is because I was listening to the 60 Minutes, the, the 60 Minutes show, like the TV show that they always go to countries and they do a 60 Minute story. They had been doing stories about the Batwa, mostly the mountain gorillas, but Every single time I watched them, they never no- mentioned the Batwa. Like, there was nothing about the Batwa. They would mention about how the gorillas are thriving and growing. And I'm like, the gorillas are thriving while my people are literally dying. What is going on? Because why is nobody mentioning that in the 60 minutes? So I was like, that's where I kind of somehow got the name for, like, call it Discover the Lost Tribe. Because these TV stations come in, record the gorillas, tell their story but then they don't really actually dig in to discover what was really the whole story behind it. And um, so this program will kind of be like an ambassadorship program where it brings American youth to Uganda and they kind of just connect with each other and help each other learn from each other's worlds. Mm-hmm. And it kind of just like sharing each other's knowledge from where they're from and Americans share their stories 
and it's also to kind of help the battle there understand that all around the world like the people have struggles but you just have to work for it because in my village my tribe thinks they are incapable of doing anything because they are batwa and that is what they're told as they're growing up but i think getting the same around the kids around the same age and discussing together knowing that oh wow like i could be in america they have similar stories or something and they still manage to actually do it so yeah Thank you for the work you're doing. I, I I think um I was talking to somebody earlier today who was mentioning the fact that we lose so much of culture because we're trying to move towards being westernized, whatever that looks like for us. And and a lot of time it gets too late for us to realize, wait, we've lost all of my culture. And mm-hmm. and so I, I love what you're describing. It's not just bringing, you know, my people to America. It's bringing America to my people. And, and helping both sides understand the culture. So when you say your people, Batuwa people, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> um, yes. When I say my people, I, it's it's kind of like a, a general, kind of like a big ironic, not really ironic. It's kind of like we're all a family. I've noticed that no matter how far or wherever we live, we're somehow related to each other. It's kind of weird. It's interesting. Like I go to a different village and I'm like, I'm related to you. My am like since when, right? <laughs> so, so I call them my people in general because we we like to be a family. We all we like to be there for each other. When there is big Christmas parties, we like to gather together and walk miles on foot just to see each other for Christmas and share our stories around the fire sometimes and dance and sing. And that's, I think some of that has become like kind of lost because uh, with the new world, they tell them that that is not the regular way they need to move on and be in the real world and not have their culture because it's weird or like that's not accepted or that's like the battle way, you know? So some of that is being like, demolished and trying to just put at the bottom of like that is not important like you need to just be this instead be this other tribe because the battle is not good and when I like to when I go there I like to say these are my people because I need them to know that because just because I'm in America and I have this nice house or I'm going to this nice school it doesn't mean that I'm not one of them I don't want them to feel like just because they're in Africa that means they're still battle and I'm not Mm, mm. so at the end of the day they still have the same capability and the same knowledge that i have they just don't have the opportunities to show that i love that um i think a lot of us adults (laughs) are even still struggling with exactly what you're describing i mean i grew up in nigeria and um you know running a non-profit focused on immigrant inclusion um a lot of you know adults that are having you know, all of this identity reawakening is about exactly what you're saying is, where do I belong? Where do I come from? And a lot of time is reminding yourself to go back to the roots of whatever it is that you crave, however you define your identity. So I'm so proud of you for (laughs) um, the work you're doing, for the work you have done on yourself as well, to be able to um, present in this way. And I know the future is very bright. So I, I wanted to say, um, when I, <clears throat> when I first started living with Joyce, when she was eight, she was failing all of her classes and she knows that I, I we tell the story. <laughs> um, and I had no idea that how bright she was. And I started homeschooling her so that, because I knew after adoption, we would eventually come to the United States and I wanted her to integrate here, but she did so amazing. And she, she like, she wasn't speaking English very well, even though English is a, you know, the national language and they teach it in school. And just to see her be in national honor society, getting, you know, very good grades, um, doing service work, like all of her teachers love her and her personality is amazing. Um, it just, it made me really, even from the beginning, when the first, we've been here six years as of yesterday in the United States. So I lived with her over there for three years um, running my nonprofit. And just to see that unlocked potential with inside her makes you realize how much unlocked potential is also within the whole Batwa tribe, even though around her, the, um, the other tribe members, just because, you know, 
there's a lot of discrimination, not everybody, of course, but they see them in a certain way, you know, they tend to be the poorest of the poor. A lot of times they have one shirt on their back. They have one meal a day if they're lucky. They are exploited for their culture, put on television, put um, dancing, and they get, you know, 2,000 shillings a month, which is like 30 cents, not even the standard a dollar a day around the world. So little, yet it's their culture and their dance and their, um, you know, everyone wants to have the Batwa people, you know, the indigenous people represented go to cultural tours, but they're not getting their fair share mm-hmm. of, of any of that money of the tourism money from the loss of their forest from, from all of that. And you see how much potential is in there, but there's forces that are keeping them down. So it's just really amazing to see Joyce do so well as, you know, telling her story and to see that people really care and that, you know, if they know more about her story that they'll also, you know, really, yeah. Maybe things will change in the next generation. Yes, it will. I mean, um, absolutely. Having people like Joyce, having a program like Discover the Lost Tribe, I think is already multiple steps in in that direction. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for what you're starting. Um, Thank you for the movement you're starting because it's not something that you can do by yourself, but um, putting a name to it, getting things kicked off, Hopefully, you know, getting this message out will also help continue to gather that support. So yeah. why is it so important for you to share your story and to be the role model that you are for other people? I feel like you already kind of started touching on this, but yeah. I want to ask clearly, like for you personally, Joyce. Um, I think for me, it's important because I feel like my like my whole younger life I like to think I had a whole I had a whole different life in Africa I feel like I lived a whole life and then I came and was reborn again and then started over again but with a different life and um but I like to the reason why this is important to me is because as a little girl with no parents and just moving from place to place I was always the left like I was always left out you know in a tribe where having a family is important I'm the only one who doesn't have like my parents there I was always left out but I always still kept my smile on people sometimes even said why is why is she always smiling so much like she's lost so much and yes she's still out there playing the kids and laughing like nothing ever happened but the thing is stuff did happen I I was experiencing stuff that was going on but I just always believed that God had a different plan for me for some reason, as a young girl at four years old, believe that God had a plan. And that's what I always lived on. That's probably what helped me survive up to this day. And it's important to me that this works out because I want to let my other people there know that they saw how how like incapable I was I was like to even go any further in my life when I was there. That nobody thought I could actually go through school or make it or even speak English like I do now but being in this position as that person that people really did not see coming out like this is like a big change for me and for them because they can now see that they can do it if I can do it Joyce or Richard from the village can do it then they can too and I think that is one of the most important things that I want to make sure that actually gets to them and to the world that it's like nothing is impossible it's just like do you have the resources do you have the chance or the opportunities to actually show off your talent or like show the world that there is more to you than just the culture and or what you wear or where you live and I think they don't understand that they think they need to live in America have electricity have a fancy bed with actual pillows to be able to be able to be successful. And I need to make let them know that that is not the case. I'm bringing this American youth over there that have totally different stories with their own things that they go through to help them understand that they're not the only ones or the only teenagers that go through that stuff. So. Absolutely. And, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about this because I think it's going to be both ways, you know, bringing American youths back to have that experience, that cultural experience almost, 
um, you know, I'm hoping that that lesson will also be learned on the other side that, yeah. you know, having what all these things that you think you need doesn't yeah. necessarily make you successful, make you mm-hmm. a person, you know, it's the core of who you are. Nobody can take that away from you, regardless mm-hmm. of what your circumstance looks like. Yeah, uh, I was going to mention that, um, that this program is going to be under my mom's organization, Redemption Song Foundation, because I don't think it would actually possibly work out if she wasn't here and I wasn't here. And um, so it would just be together as a team, just on a different role, but it would be run under her organization because we work together a lot of times. Uh, and yeah. Well, nice <laughs> transition for Wendy. Do you want to share a little bit about that program and your, your, your foundation? Yeah, so I was a journalist and I went over to Uganda on a grant. And when I saw, I was writing about how um, conservation and human livelihoods can work together or not work together as the case in the Batwa. And I, um, I saw the mountain gorillas, which were amazing. They've been my favorite animal since I was 13. And I have a master's in wildlife ecology. And through all this education and all this time, reading all the national geographics, I never heard about the Batwa. Like, how could that be? And so to see the plight and, you know, when I, I went to their village, I, I saw them dancing I, and I went to their village and I was like, wow, you know, I, I grew up somewhat poor in America and I was like, my house would have been a palace, you know, <laughs> to living in just the traditional teepee that was only meant to be a temporary abode, right? As they moved through the forest as hunter gatherers, they um, would build temporary structures, but some of them are still living in that because they didn't have a permanent, and this is a rainforest, a torrential rainforest, women um, sometimes with HIV and needing medication, but they can't get enough food in their stomach. So they can't, and just, you know, a lot of issues that just, you know, broke my heart. So I met some Ugandan friends over there when I was there and I sold my house, moved over there and started a program to help um, just do my small part. And so now we've been there for nine years. We do community education and um, which is livelihood projects to bring them income as, uh, as well as we sponsor the children in school. So pretty much everyone from the village, um, which Joyce is in, is in school, but we don't have sponsors for everybody. So my goal is to really get all of these kids and the younger generation to be, you know, to have the opportunities that Joyce has to raise enough funds that if they wanted to go to a school in Europe or America or the best school in, you know, anywhere in Africa, that they could have those funds, that they could have the potential. So they intern with our organization, they get computer skills, they, um, you know, we take them on trips. I've taken one, a couple of them on an airplane to go to Kampala, which is the capital city. And so just to let them see, and we take them on safari in Queen Elizabeth National Park so they can see Ugandans in tourism, in, you know, being park wardens and um, all those things. They can see there are jobs that you can do that is not just, you know, digging in the fields, growing, you know, vegetables, which is fine if, if they want to do that or if they want to dance. But they, you know, as they learn to be educated, to understand the, the world outside their borders, especially in this virtual world, there's so many people that want to hear um, from Indigenous people from indigenous youth and if they can get trained on things like writing or doing a podcast they could get also um, opportunities for themselves um, and and more awareness so that's kind of my longer term vision so we started out just on a local level and now we're trying to get to these kids into secondary schools and ultimately into universities so that they can you know have do amazing things like Joyce says so right if you can see it you can be it and even more Right, Bring, bringing all these opportunities. You're right. It's a, it's a global world now. You know, mm-hmm. there's all these opportunities to gain exposure without you even traveling, mm-hmm. um, out of where you are, and and that's the future. So, you guys are a power, power pair. Put <laughs> <laughs> of you together with you know the passion, the skills, and and everything that you're doing. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing all of the details with um everybody listening here. Um, do you both have anything to add before I go to my food question? I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to be here and to yeah. meet you and to, you know, be able to to tell a little bit of our story and our work. And so I'm excited to have her program that she's so excited about. Um, and just to mention that it is, 
it's um it's a longer term program so people that are interested that want to do like six months worth mm -hmm. of online volunteer work are going to then be qualified to actually go over there so not everyone so we want them to invest into the organization mm -hmm. before they get like the benefit of going over and spending that kind of money because mm -hmm. of course the money could be used but if they invest in volunteering and helping and communicating and doing <clears throat> things then they've kind of earned it and it's not mm -hmm. just a short-term mission trip kind of thing right. it's a longer term program yeah, yeah. right okay. definitely yeah i definitely want to say thank you for inviting me on this i did i was like why does she want me on her podcast and stuff like that you know so i was like this is this means a lot so thank you why do i want you on because you <laughs> inspire me you inspire me you inspire and that's what platform like this is for um right so I want to amplify voices. I want to amplify especially voices where multiple identities intersect. And so we're in these different spaces. And and I'm also, you know, passionate about giving back. I, I work with a lot of middle and high schoolers. And I know that it's not just about moving. It's about who are we bringing along? How are we carrying the next generation? So it just warms my heart to see what you're already doing at this stage. And I can't even imagine um what the next few years will be so thank you for being an inspiration <laughs> thank you i so now the food question okay so i like to end the podcast by asking people about food that way i get a lot of recipes to try <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily but um my final question is around food so if you could share a meal or a snack or a fruit with people who are not familiar with your your people your tribe what would it be and why? Like, what made you pick that one? Why is it special or important to you? Oh, I have an interesting one. Okay. So um, it will probably be a jackfruit because, first of all, I have to say American jackfruits are not good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for saying it nicely. <laughs> so the jackfruits, they, they're easier to grow because once you get the tree growing, then you can finally have like a lot coming so um the reason why that would be my favorite food to eat is because if that wasn't there then i probably would have never really eaten because sometimes we take the jackfruit off the tree when it wasn't ready when our grandpa specifically told us to wait two weeks and we didn't but the best part about the jackfruits is that there's two benefits to them that we discovered is that once you eat the jackfruit like the the regular sweet stuff the seed inside you can boil it or roast it and it okay. tastes really good it tastes like um like uh, almonds it tastes like almonds oh okay and or like sweet potatoes but african sweet potatoes oh that's it's really good. good so that's why uh we i enjoyed do, like uh, like eating those because if someone had had jackfruits and we didn't have that the seeds were still there so we could collect those and cook them then we would have food to eat. <laughs> yeah, the food that keeps feeding. <laughs> yes, exactly. I love yeah. it. I love Try it. it. It's good. You can already tell, right? Like you're thinking about giving back, sustainability, mm -hmm. everything. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't have to recycle the seed. Exactly. You keep eating. You just don't waste. You can't waste food. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now... I'm going to think about jackfruit in a different way. <laughs> oh, and the jackfruit, you know how it has like thorns at the end? Mm -hmm. uh, you use that thorn on the end to brush your hair. Oh, wow. <laughs> really big on sustainability. That's awesome, though. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Wow, mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, I'm glad I asked because that was so insightful. So thank you. Um, it was so nice talking to you both. Thank you for making the time. And I'm looking forward to sharing and, and uh, more details about the projects you have going on, about the, the give back you're doing, the exposure, the volunteer opportunities, the uh, way people can support this initiative. Um, keep inspiring. Thank, thank you, you so much. This is great. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for joining me, Lola Adeyemo, for these important conversations about the global world of work. Please rate and review this podcast wherever you get your podcast. And don't forget to share our weekly episodes with your communities and co-workers. 
For more resources and upcoming events, visit our website www.thrivingintersectionality.com and join our LinkedIn group, Thriving in Intersectionality. Additional links and resources are listed in the show notes of this episode. Thank you.